It was some good girls. They never gave me any trouble. They was typical girls. I mean, we used to go places. My mom would take us out to eat. We would go to the movies. Just normal things. I'm hoping that they are alive. Hello, my loves. So today, today we cover the case of the beautiful 15-year-old Millbrook twins. First, we have Jeanette Millbrook, and then we have Jeanette Millbrook. So now we're going to jump right into it. Early Sunday morning, March 18, 1990, Jeanette and Jeanette Millbrook went to church in the church van with their mother, Mrs. Mary Louise Sturgis, and the rest of their siblings. So now they get to church, they attend church, and at the church, their pastor gave their mother some money for food, you know, it was a bit challenging times, and money was a bit tight. So the pastor did what he could to help out. Once they got back home, Jeanette and Jeanette's mother gave them some money to go to church's chicken to pick up some food for the family. So once the girls get back, the family begins to eat. They tell their mother that this weird guy was following them around in a white van. But the girls didn't seem too frightened, so it really wasn't paid too much attention to thereafter. Not long after, their mother, Mary Louise Sturgis, told them, why don't you guys go ahead and call your godfather and see if he has any money for you guys to take the bus to school. See what happened is the family recently moved from one location to another location. Now at this new house that they were at, their high school was no longer zoned in that area for that area. So if they wanted to stay in the same environment with the same teachers that they were already familiar with, with the same friends that they were already familiar with, then they would need to go ahead and take public transportation to and from school. So the girls call up their godfather. The godfather answers the phone. He said, I got you, come on down. So the girls began to leave out the house. Now, as they started to leave out the house, their sister, Jessica, approaches them and says, I wanna go with you. And they said, no, you're just gonna slow us down. And though Jessica was the younger sister, she still didn't have a good feeling about the situation. For some reason, something just seemed off. So Jeanette and Jeanette set off to their godfather's house. Once they got to their godfather's house, he was so excited to see them. So he gave Jeanette and Jeanette $20 so that they would have that money to take the bus back and forth to school that week. Their godfather also gave them $2 each. He gave $2 to Jeanette and he gave $2 to Jeanette. You know, so they had a little bit of extra change in their pocket. Plus on their way home, if they wanted to stop at the store, they had some money that they could go ahead and get their grub on, right? So the girls set off to go back home. Now they run into Mrs. Angus Jones. Now, Mrs. Angus Jones was like family to them. She attended school with their grandmother. Along the way, they stopped at their cousin Juanita's house. Now, their cousin Juanita was nine years old at the time. And their house was like a second home for Juanita. Juanita was there every chance she could get. So the girl stopped, knocked on the door, and asked Juanita's mother, could Juanita walk back home with them? Now, unexpectedly, Juanita's mother said, no, she can't, but she'll see you guys tomorrow. Juanita was so sad, she went to her room and she bawled her eyes out. She cried and she cried and she cried herself to sleep. So, on their journey back home, they also stopped at their sister's house. 
and this sister unfortunately was not able to walk back with them because she had just had a child. It became later and later. So the later that it got, their mother, Mary Louise Sturgis, became more concerned. She picked up the phone and she called their godfather to see if the girls wind up making it there. He said, yeah, they did come over. I gave them $20 for the bus and I gave them $2 each so they had a little extra change in their pocket. So right after, their mother had spoke to her daughter and she asked her, did you see the girls? She said, yeah, the girls did stop by here, but you know, I couldn't walk back with them home because I just had the baby. But I did notice that they were walking back towards the uh, pumping shop on the way back home. So she said, okay. She got her other daughter, uh, Jeanette and Danette's sister, Shantae Sturgis, and they walked to the pumping shop. So once they got to the pumping shop, they went inside and they saw the store clerk, Mrs. Gloria. So they asked Mrs. Gloria, did she see Jeanette and Danette? And she said, yeah, absolutely, she saw them. They came in, they got some candy, chips, and soda. And she said it was so busy after. By the time she looked up, the girls were gone without a trace. She doesn't know who uh, Jeanette and Danette left with. If anybody else came in the picture, she just didn't see because it became a bit, a bit busy at the time. So uh, Mary Louise Sturgis goes back home with her daughter, Shantae, and she calls the police. The police tell her that they have to wait 24 hours before they can even do a missing persons report. So 24 hours passed, and Jeanette and Danette still had not made it home yet. So their mother picks up the phone and calls the police back. And they said, okay, we'll send detective out so the door knocks and it is the investigator detective shit so he gets there he he tells them that they probably just ran away now detective ship didn't know the girl at all so for him to come up with that assumption was just it was just unfathomable and then he takes their information. They only make it on the news one time. And they never make it in the newspaper. Mind you, this is 1990. So at this time, there was no online media. It was people relied on the newspaper still. The girls never made it to the newspaper. Now, on the report that he did have, in that one news broadcast that he did have, he got the spelling of the girls' names wrong. He got their date of birth wrong. The only thing that he practically got right is what they were wearing that day. The detective, he only went out to the godfather's house. He didn't go and speak to Mrs. Angus Jones, who they saw along their way home. He did not go and speak to their cousin Juanita's mother, whose house they stopped at on their way home. And he did not go and speak to their older sister, who the girls once again saw on their journey home. Not only that, Detective Ship, this investigator, he did not stop by the pumping shop and speak to Miss Gloria. And mind you, that is the last known place that the girls had been. So, a year passed. And in that time frame, investigator Ship didn't reach out to the family. Any time that they needed any type of updates, they were the ones calling in, and it wasn't much update to be given because the case really wasn't investigated. So a year later, about two weeks after the girl's birthday, April 1991, Detective Ship comes to their house, there's a knock on the door. Their mother, Mary Louise Sturgis, opens the door and she is in high hope that he may possibly, possibly have information on the girl. 
But instead, he's there to tell them that the girls are basically aging out the system and that the case will be closed. Two years later, in 1993, there's another knock at the door. Once again, it's detective ship. So, Mrs. Louise opens the door and begins the conversation with detective ship. He's there to let her know that not only is this case closed and he's moving to another apartment um, department, they're officially not looking for the girls anymore. And this time, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children was contacted and someone contacted them to say that the girls had been found. So they had to remove the girls, Jeanette and Danette, out of their registry. So once this was looked in further, it was found out that it was indeed Detective Ship who stated that the girls had been found. So as the time went on, Detective Ship had also stated that the girl's principal stated he saw the girls outside of the high school on the corner of the high school and when he went and called their name, they ran off. In addition, Detective Ship stated he spoke to quite a few of the girls' schoolmates who had said they saw Jeanette and Danette. When it came to their missing case files, Detective Ship had stated that their case files were missing. And then another time, Detective Ship stated that he had forwarded the girl's case file to a juvenile probation officer. And this probation officer stated that he had spoken to the girls and the girls stated that they were on their way to Texas. Mind you, Jeanette and Danette had no known family or friend link to the state of Texas. This was a time when there was no internet, no Wi-Fi, um, there was no GPS system. So how in the world would they make it there with $20 in their pocket? And what would they live off of even if they did get there? So it just didn't make sense. In this time, we found out that the high school principal that Detective Ship stated saw the girls on the corner of the high school, well, he's dead. So he's no longer here to testify. In addition, that probation officer, well, I've never found out the name of that probation officer. And I really highly doubt that a uh, juvenile probation officer exists. So Jeanette and Danette Millbrook's sister, Shantae Sturges, um, was very persistent in trying to get their case reopened. You know, and once a new sheriff came on the scene and made a lot of promises to the community and saying what he will start to do for the community and how he will change the community, Shantae persisted to get her sister's case reopened. So the case was reopened and uh, two women from the Fall Line podcast decided to cover this case. In so doing, they also uh, aligned and got information of people who were in the area at the time who was committing uh, crimes of abduction, you know, molestation, um, killing, etc. So they got all their information. Not only that, they went ahead and um, they sought out Jeanette and Danette Millbrook's father and to see who he was tied to and what connections he had. See, John Millbrook, Danette and Jeanette's father, uh, had no interest, or show no interest in fighting for the girls to see uh, where they where they were. As a matter of fact, he told his older daughters if um, the cops come out or the investors come out looking for him, just tell them that he was dead. 
And every time uh, the girl's mother, Mary Louise Sturgis, decided to go on and uh, say, we need to go ahead and look for, for our daughters. We need to go ahead and see what happened to our daughters. He said, no, he didn't seem like he was interested at all. He didn't want to do it at all. So it was a wonderful idea for um, the ladies of the Fall Line podcast to go ahead and see who he was connected to at that time because he was connected to a lot of drug dealers and a lot of um, people that were uh, just on the wrong side of the track, you know. So they find out a couple of the people he was connected to. They reached out to one of them in jail, who was currently in jail at the time and who still is, and his name is Mr. Ernest Vaughn. Now, they asked him if he had known anything that happened with the Millbrook twins. And he said, what if I might, he actually replied, he said, what if I might could tell you what happened to the girl? So the ladies went ahead and forwarded that letter to the police department so the sheriff and detective would have information of someone who possibly knew what happened to the girl. That information was never taken seriously. Um, There was a lot of broken promises as far as what the sheriff stated that he would actually do for the family and for the community, you know. So now we're gonna jump right into it. He called the cops. Yes. What did you say? Tell me about that phone call. I told him my girl was missing and he told me that they got to be missing for 24 hours before he go looking for them. Do they express any concern whatsoever at that point in time? No. And we waited 24 hours and she called. The dispatcher then put you through to somebody else. Mm -hmm. The somebody else was a man? Yes. Did he give you his name? Detective Ship. Detective Ship. And when you talked to him, you said, "My, my girls are missing. And he said what to you? He said they probably ran away. Now, he says this mm-hmm. not knowing you from a can of paint. He don't right. know who you are. Right. And he uses the term, they probably ran away. Yeah. Jim Ship was the original investigator. I don't know if he would have cared about them if they were living on the other side of town, if their parents had more money. I'm not certain, but for whatever reason, he decided these children were runaways, and he didn't look for them. I've seen mediocre investigations, but I've rarely seen no investigation, and that's what we saw in the case of the Millbrook twins. Basically, anybody that was our color was runaway. This is the first case of missing twins that are still missing today, and nobody knows about them. Somebody knows what happened to them two girls. I know for a fact they didn't run away from home. According to his family, John Millbrook could at times be a very cruel person. He was not interested in talking about the case. He never wanted to look for him. He even told my older sister, um, which she's passed away now, but he told her, my sister Asiander, that if they came to her house and asked her about him, tell the police that he was dead. These are your daughters. Why wouldn't you want to look for them? We just couldn't understand it. As you were telling us about the the day that the twins disappeared, your mom and yourself, you contacted the police. Yeah, and he said, uh, well, they must have ran away from home. And he assumes it's a runaway situation. Yeah. Right off the hop. Why? I'm thinking the reason why, because of where we live. So these were just rumors and rumbling. Right. But the detective was taking it to heart. Right. Jim Ship was the original investigator on the case. I called, I explained to him about the podcast. I asked him if he remembered the case. He said, yeah, those two runaways. I did ask him if he thought the twins were alive. And he said, I don't know any reason why they wouldn't be. 
And then he started laughing and he said, if you find two dead twins, you let me know. The family needs justice, period. I know your connection to Augusta is very strong. Tell us about it. First of all, I want to thank y'all for, for coming. Any resources we can get to try to bring some closure to families um, is, is more than welcome. I was born and raised here. Um, and actually, in this particular case, um, the area in which the twins were uh, um, last seen was the area in which I grew up in. Um, I mean, it was less than a mile away. Why do you think that this case was not treated as something sinister, but instead as a simple runaway? I mean, plain and simple, and injustice was done to the family. There was no follow-up or nothing. I mean, when I read the Millbrook twins case, the case was closed. It was just based on an anonymous person say, hey, we, we saw them, they're okay. This day and age, that's, that would not happen now. You're talking about in the, in the early 90s, it was a dis different atmosphere here. Do I think there was institutional racism back in 1990? Absolutely. Do I think it exists today? Yeah. You reopened the case. Has anything come up with, from it yet? I um, had a couple of investigators to work it, pass it off some fresh set of eyes. Have your investigators that you've assigned, have they been able to develop any additional suspects in this case? I don't know if you would say suspects. Um, some people of interest. Perhaps. People of interest have come in that need to be um, vetted more. When you get a case that's 30 years old, when you're starting, you're really starting in the hole. We are starting way behind. Uh, we don't have a, a unit designed or dedicated strictly for cold cases. These officers are working this case in the midst of hot cases that are coming, homicides, armed robbers, kidnapping, child molesters. And that's why now um, I'm glad that you all come and shed some more light on the case. I'm hoping we, we're going to be able to help you. Anything you need, anything that we can provide, that we're going to make it at your, at your disposal. Working this case, you're going to help even if we don't solve it. It helps heal some of those wrongs that people have felt over 30 years. You know what? We, we keep saying nobody cared, but the Fall Line podcast yeah. brought this case back into the national spotlight. I would love to pick their brain. Why did you call it the Fall Line? Brooke came up with a name. Um, we were looking for something that could signal a lot of things at one time. Literally, Augusta's on the fall line in Georgia, which is a geographic line where the plant life and the animals and the soil even are so different from one side to the other. How did you even find this case? We looked at other crimes that had occurred in Augusta. And once we felt like we understood a lot about Augusta, that's when we contacted the family. Brooke actually wrote to Shantae on Facebook. Wow. She had her own um, Facebook page for the girls. And Laura dug in and, and started finding all these things about similar crimes that had taken place in the area just right down the road. You would think we would know this information. Unfortunately, because the media was so uninterested, no one knew any of it. So we wrote letters to alumni of high schools to see who remembered the twins. We tracked down families. Yeah. But then I especially went into the archives and just began to dig through crime reports and see who was getting hurt, where, and why. And once we did that, we began to realize that there were people living in a centralized area in Augusta, very near where the twins disappeared, that had committed violent crimes. Okay. We want to further this case. You all have done tremendous work. We want to follow up. Is there a string we can pull? Is there some trees we can shake? One of the most disturbing things we found was a man who was an alleged serial killer who was operating in their neighborhood named Joseph Patrick Washington. Based on the reporting at the time, uh, they were very sure he killed at least two women, possibly three. He actually abducted a woman in the parking lot of the pumpkin shop. Or very near, yeah. Really? He would pull up in his car, he had a gun, he would point the gun at people and say, get in the car, I'm going to shoot you. And so the women would get in the car and he would drive away and take them to a second location where he would sexually assault them and in some cases murder them. 
Of the people he killed, did they have something in common? They did. They were all young black women with short hair. And Jeanette and Danette. Were young, short hair, black girls. He died in 1999. He was arrested in 93. The twins' case was already closed, so he was never considered a suspect in their case. One of the difficulties in cold cases is the time element. You know, when time passes on, things happen to people. You know, they, they move away, they die, uh, they forget, memories fade. Did you identify any other suspects that you thought should have been looked into at the time? Or look at the people close. So we began to look at their father, and we discovered that based on public record, he had had quite a few run-ins with the law. He had several friends. But we saw two names in particular that came up again and again. Reggie Cummings and Ernest Vaughn. OK. These friends were involved in drug crime. And there were two murders that happened that were related to one another. And John Milbrook, after the fact, was involved in hiding one of the bodies at the local wow. landfill. And we began to see there was some kind of relationship there. OK. Between Reginald Cummings, Ernest Vaughn, and John Milbrook. Yes. So Laura said, Brooke, why don't you write them a letter? Um, and that's the easiest way to get in contact with someone who's in prison, write them a letter. So that's what we did. You just asked them what? We asked them a few things. We asked them if they remembered John Milbrook. We asked them if they remembered his daughters. Well, did they respond? Yeah, they did. They did. So, mm -hmm. And I have wow. the letters. You yeah. have the letters. Yeah. yeah. These are the ones that they wrote back to us. This is from Ernest Vaughn. Ernest. Greetings, Brooke. You've asked a few questions in which I don't mind answering. But what if I told you that I know where you might could find them? Sincerely, Ernest Vaughn. Wow. I wanted so bad to, to write back. I wanted to call him. I wanted to get in touch with him right away. But if anyone could be held accountable for what happened to the girls, we didn't want to mess it up by getting in the mix. Um, so immediately, Laura and I both agreed the best thing to do is to turn it over to the police as soon as possible. Um, so I called Richmond County. I was told at the time that this would be handled. I called a few times after that, maybe one other time, essentially begging, please. Um, I reiterated, this family's been waiting for answers. This person might have them. Yeah. The months are passing, right. please. Um, and that was two years ago, and nothing has been done. You've heard nothing from the DA or Richmond County or the police or anything? Not a thing. Even when somebody has said that they might be able to tell you where they can be found? You haven't heard anything for two years. We've tried to hear things for two years. I'm holding in my hand right now what could possibly be the key to solving a 30-year mystery of the disappearance of two human beings, their children. And for two years, it's just been sat on with nothing. But we're going to talk to Ernest Vaughn. He actually wrote back. Ernest Wall. He wrote back. Things are aligning, man. He wants to talk to us. Yeah. He wants to give information as much as he has it. OK. And in terms of actually meeting him, I mean, he's obviously still at Dodge State Prison. But it turns out he has a daughter that lives in Augusta, not too far away. And wow. she spoke to her on the phone. And she says that tomorrow we can oh. come by her house. And she's going to connect us on the phone with Ernest Wall. Oh, Wallace. I love it. I'm loving it. Let's do it. Let's do it sooner than later. I know, before he changes his mind. You get me on the phone with this cat, he gonna tell me something. He's gonna tell me something and something good that's gonna help us in this case. So, He's supposed to call you today. He can call us any minute now. Uh -huh. And he knows that we're here uh -huh. and wants to talk. Uh -huh. How long has he been in prison? Since I was a baby. So, so do you know about the case of the missing Millbrook twins? Yeah. So your father, Ernest, got a letter from us 
asking him if he knew anything mm -hmm. about the missing twins. Yeah. Has he told you what he knows? Uh. I mean, he just told me, a, like, a couple of things. Yeah. That's about it. You seem a little hesitant. Does it trouble you because you're worried about him, or you worried about him? No, his well -being? I mean, I do just, like, you don't want to say? Nah. It's been, uh, it's been a tough situation for a lot of people. What we're hoping we can accomplish is for Ernest to kind of share with us some of the same things he shared with you. And I guarantee you, it's going to help a lot of people. Well, I'm going to ask you this what if question. I know you didn't ask for it, but you have a wonderful and precious and powerful position right now where you can help us. What if? We're unable to speak to him today. Would you be willing to talk to us about the conversation you had with him? Don't answer right away. You're in a unique position to help this family. You really are. So think about it and consider it. Yeah. I can see your heart beating, April. What are you thinking? I just feel like I'm in a weird position, like... I just feel like I'm in a really weird position. Yeah. Let me tell you what goes through my mind in this case. You and I were both 15-year-old girls, right? I, like you, have a daughter. I have a son. And I think my daughter's five years old now. Just had her birthday. And I think, what would it be like, God forbid, 10 years from now, I send that little girl to the store and I never see her again. And someone tells me that the little girl that I know loves her mother ran away from me. And I know her. I know my daughter would not leave me like that. I know my daughter would call me. I know my daughter would find a way to get to me. And I know that if something happened to her, the last thing she would call is my name. Not her father, not her grandmother, not her brother, but it'd be my name she called. And I cannot tell you what it felt like to talk to her mother. And I watched her living 30 years ago and wondering where her daughters were. Not one, but two daughters. Yeah. And I know that people didn't care enough to find out where they were. Did he tell you where they were? Did he tell you anything? Just share with us that peace. It would, it would be so much help. Can we take a break? Can I take a break? Huh? Can I, is it okay if I take a break? Mm -hmm. If you need to, yeah. It's your house. We are so close, Paige. One phone call away from knowing what happened to yeah. She may have to tell us what she knows. It may not come from him. And that's my point. We may not, can't, we may, we can't afford to wait on this guy. This makes you feel so emotional. We her. can't leave, we can't leave this house without her telling us what she knows. Simple as that. She doesn't want to be the one to, 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 to say, say what people's worst fears might be. Yeah, that's no, real. I get that too. Mama just said. Okay. They ain't alive. Okay. 
I knew that. And he can tell y'all exactly where they buried it. And he know who did it. You think he know he's, he knows who did it? But he's able to also give us a location, you think? Mm -hmm. Okay. He didn't go further than that. Nope, I didn't ask him. I just switched, after that, I just switched subjects. I ain't want to know no more after that. You believe him? Yeah. That was hard for you to say. Mm hmm What you have shared with us is not going to hurt. It's going to help. We really want to talk to him. So we'll look to you, OK, for your help in putting us in contact. I still want to hear it from him. It should be from him. Thank you. All right, honey, thank you. All right, we'll see you later. What's up? That was April. She said we can go by her house after work today, and she'll get him on the phone with us. What happened with him not being able to speak to us the first time? Well, she said that the, the prison was actually on lockdown, so he couldn't get to the phone. When a prison is on lockdown, that means everybody's relegated to their cell. They don't move out of their mm -hmm. cell. It hurt her to even talk about it. I think it was compassion. It was I think compassion. I think she did, I think she didn't want to be the bearer of any bad news. I feel that she's genuinely trying to help us. And if I can get this cat on the phone, he's going to tell us something that's going to help us. How are you, sir? All right, all right. So, Ernest, I'm here too. My name is Laura. I'm sitting here as well. Listen, I'm not going to waste your time, but I thought that I maybe could uh, talk to you about some of those events with the missing twins, and perhaps the both of us, we could help each other. I'll tell you this. Let me Let me begin by telling you we are not the police. And I believe the biggest issue that we've come across was because these were two little black girls. And nobody cared, Ernest. Nobody cared, man. And, you know, it's just been heartbreaking. So you got the floor, man. Uh, tell me something good, Ernest. Tell me something good, brother. Uh-huh. Uh huh. I was young and I was in the dope game, but I wasn't the one to know trying. I wasn't number like 12 years old, but I was selling dope for one of the big dudes trying. But I ain't know what the girls were, but you don't see something, you don't say that because my sister get put in the ditch back in the 90s. You know, that's how it went down. I understand. John? So John, so John Milbrook, you say he was a crackhead. So 
You saw you saw the girl when she got hit and hit the table? Yeah. And her sister was there? Yeah. How many men were in the house? Let me ask you this. Do you know where the bodies are? You saw the girl when she got hit and hit the table? And her sister was there. Who told everyone to leave? Do you know where the bodies are? No, I understand. They used to go put them over there in Augusta. They got a little spot over there called Memory Brother Great Joe. And they used to hide bodies over there. Do you know any of them old cats that own the white van? I just can't come there when I start talking to people in high places. I just can't give them a general story. I gotta have something that's gonna have some power to it where they're gonna say, ah, okay. Give me a name of one of the cats that was there or one of the cats that had their way with one of them girls. Something concrete I can sink my teeth into, Ernest. I need that from you, brother. He was there? Yes, sir. Was he one of the ones that had his way with one of these twins? Yep. But you don't know his real name, you just know a nickname, Lil' Cheese. Yeah. And what about John? What about their father? He never said anything? I don't know what to say about that. What just happened? What just happened? What just happened? It's an answer, but do you believe him? Maybe it's the prosecutor and me, but a lot of people who suddenly, after 30 years or any period of time, who suddenly remember or suddenly feel like telling you something, mm -hmm. is it because they're opportunistic or they're being altruistic all of a sudden? I believe him. It rang authentic to me. He's not trying to be involved with anything negative if he can help it. I think he was ready. Some of the best information I got as an investigator have been from crackheads, <laughs> thieves, murderers. I mean, credible, legitimate information. Who are your eyewitnesses for drug deals, drug users? Absolutely. How do you bring down pimps, prostitutes? Yeah. And w I'm sorry, w can we just... John Milbrook was there? Miss Louise, you yeah. called him mean and cruel. And she said that she had to leave him because she was afraid that he would start to physically hurt the little girls. And if what 
Ernest says is true, they couldn't get far enough away from their father because in the end, it led to their death. No, I, I think that a lot of that information is, 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 is powerful and it puts the pieces of this puzzle together for us. However, we have to validate a few things, you know. I've heard all these nicknames, Oodle Boy. I've heard Nick Little Cheese. First of all, are these real people? Yeah. Are they really known to law enforcement? Does anybody know who they are? And as much as this story, even if everything we've heard up till now is true, yeah. it still hasn't answered the question, where is Jeanette and Danette? Right. Where are they? So we did have a chance to speak to Ernest. He did mention two names. Do you know anyone who goes by a nickname Oodle Boy? You ever heard that name before? No. Do you know someone named Little Cheese? I know Little Cheese. He got a brother named Big Cheese. I remember when I was growing up, I used to hear those names. They used to be um, supposed to be big time drug dealers here. They were in this area? Um. They live down in the bottom, like towards Third Street and um, River Glen. Near Third Street? Mm -hmm. Did John used to have an apartment over there? Yes. Did he? He did. Did your sisters ever go to their father's house? Yeah, all of us used to go there. Was the drug dealing going on inside that apartment complex? Yeah. OK. What was the drug? It, it was all, all down that way, I know that. Have you ever heard people talk about them recently? Mm -mm, I ain't heard nothing about them in years. Every name that we hear, we want to mm -hmm. talk to them. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. when the names come up, so we want to talk to Little Cheese, we want to talk to Oodle Boy. We, we trying to talk to everybody we can, mm -hmm. because everybody got a little piece. Yes. But we're going to dig. We're going to dig, you know. It's all, it's all yeah. coming together here. All these pieces, they're now coming together. Whether we want to or not, information that we've been able to, to glean from people, the word begins to get out. That's just how the street works. And so we got to move. We got to move quickly. According to Ernest, there's a chance that their bodies, if he's telling the truth, are in the brickyards. Yeah. This place gives me the creeps. Yeah, it's creepy. Paige, this is huge. Are you kidding me? Wow. Are you kidding me? Look at this place. It could be anywhere. What do you got over there? Women's clothing. Women's clothing. This is where you would want to do it. If you were a bad guy, you're going to dump a body. It, it, just look at how thick that is. You can't see a foot into it. And this is the middle. I mean, we're in the city. We're, you know how close we are to Augusta? Can you imagine what lurks around at night in this place? If you were going to dump a body, you wouldn't even have to bury it. You would just leave it somewhere and let the animals do the rest. We need help, because I. this is not a place we need to be searching on our own. Could you imagine the search area? No. This encompass, from where we're standing, you're probably talking three to five mile radius in every direction. You got to get the sheriff out here, Laura. Yeah. You got to get, we got to get some help. I'm glad that we're back talking to you. I thought you'd really want to know some of the progress that we've made. One of the things that we did was speak to two women involved in the Fall Line podcast. Their names are Laura and Brooke. And they were involved, frankly, very intimately in trying to get this story national exposure. They reached out to people, either incarcerated or otherwise, who may have known something. And they looked to John Milbrook's associates. These two women from the podcast reached out to an inmate currently serving a life sentence at Dodge State Prison for murder 
His name is Ernest Vons. And he responded that he might know something about where you could find the bodies of these two girls. We had an opportunity to speak to Ernest Vaughn. And here's where he told us this entire story. He apparently was 12 years old at the time, standing outside of the home, watching in, having been associated with the individuals, and saw everything and was told to leave. Ernest shares with us this information, not just because he heard on the street, Ernest was there. The last moments of the twins' life. So, Sheriff, this is what you're dealing with, brother. You're dealing with an eyewitness. It's going to take your resources, brother, to convince this gentleman to go on the stand. What we found out, Sheriff, was that a man drove up to the twins in probably what was a white van. Interestingly enough, a white van had been following them just hours before their disappearance. They get in the van. It appears that this man drives them to a location. The location appears to be a drug house, in the Third Street area. Bear with me. A lot of questionable, illegal, shady activity were going, was going on in this particular home. The home belonged to the daddy, Mr. Millbrook, or at least he lived there. Turns out that Mr. Millbrook had some personal demons of his own, some struggles. So he was renting out the use of his apartment to the local drug dealers, not for money, but for crack. They paid him in crack. The girls, while the daddy is present, the crack-addicted father, while he's present, the girls are being lured at their daddy's home by these neighborhood drug dealers. They're giving them marijuana. They're drinking with them. They're getting them high and inebriated so that they let their guards down. One girl, at some point, after arriving at the daddy's home, is sexually assaulted by one of these drug dealers. The other twin, in defense of her sister, wants to come to her rescue and attempts to fight and jump on these drug dealers who are doing this to her sister. One of these drug dealers responds, he punches the neck. She falls, hits her head on what may be a coffee table or something, busts her head wide open, blood everywhere. Somebody makes the announcement, everybody get out. Everybody that was in the apartment at that time, leave. And that's the last time that anyone sees them. So that's kind of how things were going down. Several names have come up. Nicknames. What? There's a Little Cheese. His brother, Big Cheese. Fella. Wait, what's your reaction? <laughs> Why do you smile? It seems to be quite knowing. These are names uh, when I started my career early on, and I worked the uh, street level uh, narcotics unit, and these um, were common names of individuals that we've arrested on several occasions. So I am familiar with both individuals um, by their nicknames and, again, by their arrest record. So that does not surprise me at all. Um, so Little Cheese exists. Little Cheese exists. Oodle Boy. These are names of individuals that we, as an agency, are very familiar with. I guess what blows me away is these are names you can't make up. have the letter signed okay. by Ernest Bonds. This is all, <clears throat> it's a little overwhelming. And you all physically spoke to this individual. Mm -hmm. Looked him in his eyes. Over the phone. Over the phone. And he told you this story. Yes. Mm -hmm. We need to get him on record um, as soon as possible. We need to get him in a sworn statement. Um, and then we, if, if he relates the story that, that he's related to you all, we're that much further, we're right there. 
as far as bringing that closure that honestly in October when we started, I didn't think we'd get to. I just thought we were just too far behind the curve. I was willing to try. And this is something I guarantee you um, we will have extreme follow-up on. I mean, you've given us more um, within a little bit of time we spent together than they've had in almost 30 years. If it takes me interviewing him, that is something I'm more than willing to do. If it takes me traveling to interview this individual, that is something that will happen. The moment we get any movement, um, I'll make sure you're contacted. I, mean, I will keep you right in step with where we are, right up to the fact that hopefully when I tell you um, that we have an indictment, I'll Thank up until that point. Thank you, Sheriff Brown. Thank you, Sheriff. I can see it in both of your eyes. You want answers, and you have for 30 years. And even just now, I feel the extreme weight of just what it's been feeling like. We came here today to tell you what we learned. When we spoke to Ernest Vons, he wanted to tell us what he saw and what he knew about that day. Ernest told us, your daughters went to the pump and shop. When they went there that day, everything was as you thought. They ended up at their father's home. And when they went to his home, um, it was being used for drug sales in and out of the home. From what we've been told, at the home that day, a man tried to take advantage of one of your daughters. And the other one saw it, and she fought for her. She really, she fought for her. And in the process of fighting for her sister, one of the men hit her. And when he hit her, she fell backwards. She hit her head. And I think the people in the room began to panic because one of the girls was hurt so badly. Your sisters were killed. Now, the reason we know what part of this is because um, Ernest Bonds was about 12 years old, and he was standing there and saw what happened. The reason we asked you, Shantae, about two names. Little Cheese and Oodle Boy. They were the principal people that were involved in what happened to your sisters, to your daughters that day. This little cheese and this oodle boy. We forwarded their names to the sheriff's department. You are good people. I understand. <laughs> I desperately wished that when we came here, Paige, it was it was it was going to be different news. It was going to be that um, mm -hmm. that they were going to be here again. And I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah. Can I? Miss Louise, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm just so sorry. You were good, my daughter. Your daughters loved you. They loved you. They couldn't even love you. Oh. I'm sorry. We spoke with the sheriff, and they know who these people are. Um, In fact, the second that we, we told them, they're corroborating everything. It doesn't stop here. They're, they're building a case for prosecution. It shouldn't have took this long. I know. I know. Just like they didn't matter. 
And I knew my girls. I know they didn't run away. I tried to tell them that. They you would did. not listen. You did. You wouldn't listen. What they buy is it? Well, it's been 30 years, as you know. Yeah. So the investigators are trying their best to see if they can find their remains for a proper burial. Now that, I have to be honest with you, I don't know if that's gonna happen. Miss Louise, you're good. Yeah. Like you're a good mother. You know that, right? You're a good mother. <laughs> they did not leave you. And I want to say this to both of you. What happened is not y'all's fault. No. And y'all need to understand no. that. Ladies, I know how hard this is. How hard this has been. We were desperate to give you some, some form of closure. Sometimes closure is a prosecution and a conviction. Sometimes it's just knowing the answer. And believe me, the police, they're not off the hook. This is not something you can put a bow on and say, okay, it's, it's over. Yeah. They still have a responsibility, the same one they had 30 years ago. And we believe that they're doing something now. It's not enough that just somebody else cares. What they need is closure. We get a surprise phone call this morning from the investigators telling us they're on their way to Dodge State Penitentiary here in Georgia to interview Ernest Vaughn. Uh, the bottom line is whatever they do now uh, is going to make or break the prosecution of the case. My fellow lawmen. How are you, sir? Gentlemen, I appreciate meeting you all. Um, Sarge, detective. Give me some good news, because I've been hearing a lot of bad news. Tell me something good. We can't really discuss the case right now. Uh, we're glad that we were given the case to try and bring justice to this family and see if we can't find these girls. But as far as uh, what's been going on, we can't really discuss that, and that's for the integrity of the case purposes. Did what you received today, speaking with Ernest, coming here, are you optimistic? I mean, you know. Again, it, it's kind of hard to say without divulging any details. Um, I felt like it's been a good day. Okay. But we'll that's, that's about all I can but, say. Well, cause... well, brother, that's something. Listen, you, you got to appreciate something. This family has gotten nothing. Yes. That's correct. For 30 years. Yes. You, you understand what I'm saying? Oh, so, yeah. That's correct. And, and what you're saying is what people have been telling them for years, either what, what you just said or um, nothing we can do for you. That's what they've been hearing. It's all about the integrity of the case, which is why we can't go into detail. Okay, Shante, I have to get this straight. We spoke to Ernest Vaughns. He identified several people being present the day he watched your sisters be hurt. We then speak to the Sheriff's Department about information we have. They then go and speak with Ernest Vaughns directly, who mentions the people and corroborates the story again. They assume that Ernest Vaughns is describing a different incident of two girls being hurt in the way he described. Yes. They believe the story, but it wasn't my sister and them that he was talking about. Who told you that? That's what um, the investigator said. 
I asked them what the little cheese say. Right. They said he lawyers up off top. Say he want to talk. If y'all want to talk to me, I want my lawyer. And since then, they mm -hmm. have not investigated anything else. I don't know if they did or not, cause they keep saying they gonna call me back. They gonna call me back and let me know what they done came up with, but nobody never called. Same thing I've been going through for the last 30 years. I had a conversation with April. Her dad is Ernest Vaughn. I told her I wanted to know from him what he said was true. So I told her to ask him again if the story that he gave was the truth or did he make the whole thing up. So she asked him, again, and he said that it was the truth. And the investigators from Richmond County told him to say that he made the story up. We have to speak to the investigators, and my hope is we'll have some answers for you. I hope so. In talking with Shantae, we've learned that the investigators have not kept them up to date haven't bothered to come by or speak to the mother in person. But even more than that, they're telling her that it was some other girls, not Danette and Jeanette. Somehow, they believe everything that Ernest Vaughn's had to say, but he got his victims wrong? Why were you so quick to not believe Ernest Vaughn's? Is there more to that angle? What else do we need to know? Since we last spoke, a lot has happened. I know you, your yeah. team has been investigating. Yeah, um, a lot, a lot has happened. Y'all um, left us a, a, a lot to think about and a lot to do. We knew that um, these individuals existed, this house existed, that people gathered there, um, there was narcotics trafficking going on at this residence, which we can confirm through case files. Within two days, we were um, on the road, heading to the prison to interview um, that individual. Um, and as we pressed for details in the subject, revealed that he fabricated the parts when it came in connection with, with the girls. So the location of John Milbrook's home was a known drug site that, that people, there had been multiple warrants executed mm -hmm. at that residence. The people, including the nicknames we gave you, are people who frequented that area. But as far as seeing Danette and Jeanette Milbrook there on that day, from the moment he mentioned them, that was all fabricated. I, I'm going again by the expertise of my investigative team. Ernest Vaughn made a statement that he was told by the investigators not to tell us the truth and to say that he had made it up. I, I think that's preposterous to even repeat. Um, that doesn't even sound believable. That actually is, is offensive to law enforcement everywhere. So um, what are you doing to pursue the case? Are you waiting to have information come to you? Or? Well, we, we have some some leads that we're, that we're looking at. Could you give us some sort of update? What's been going on? What has happened since we last spoke? Uh, we interviewed every person. I think Little Cheese was still incarcerated, so um, he pretty much didn't want to speak with us at all. Met with us and um, exercised his, his right not to speak. Mm -hmm. He lawyered uh, up. Absolutely, immediately. What did Oodle Boy say? I don't know which team spoke to him, um, but it was nothing of evidentiary value, I guess. Well, Sheriff, um, I connected with the family. Their perception is that there is an apathetic, uh, a non-caring uh, position from law enforcement. We this particular case didn't pan out the way we wanted it to, or we had hoped it to. It may not be the closure, the resolution that ultimately we will all want. Can I just take one second? I think, you know, Sheriff, just very frankly, there's still a lot of questions. I mean, you're telling us that Ernest Bonds is telling you that he's lying. But he's telling the whole community, y'all are put pressure on him to, to say he lied. Even these answers we have here, we don't know what Oodle Boy said, which doesn't make any sense anyway, because he's not going to admit to doing anything. We don't really know what happened with Little Cheese. It's tough because it my, is, ain't it, it? Yeah, and, and I don't know the best. So I'm. That's why I'm. You know, we're putting it to you guys. Like, we just, ain't no problem. Yeah, I, it's, it's tough. Cr criminals lie. All right. All right. 
Well, thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. I'm more frustrated today than when I started the investigation because what I see in many ways is history repeating itself. It leaves the family searching for answers. My frustration level is very high right now because what we provided to the authorities, I believe was substantial. I've arrested people for less. Where do we go from here? Where does the family go from here? Because clearly justice has not been served yet. That's the million dollar question, man. I don't know. I don't know. And uh, that's deeply disturbing. I've seen what justice looks like for other families in this country. And it was completely denied to them. It was as if they were supposed to accept that someone saw them as nothing. What happened to this family should never have happened. guys so I was hoping that I can um, add my discussion my interview with Shante Sturgis uh, the twins sister in this video however this video became so much longer than I, than I intended so I plan on um, had do, uh, speaking with Shante on my psychic reading video where I'll go ahead and do a collab on this case. Uh, and hopefully we'll have uh, more, at least one more of uh, the twin siblings on there as well. So check out the description box because if it's done, you're gonna find the link below. Thank you so much.